Your film today, Joel, is a cinematic tranquilizer starring Ben Murphy called Being from Another Planet. This time we watched Season 4, Episode 5, Being from Another Planet. In which a mummy who is a being from another planet collects jewelry and phones home. But first, you know, we always start with follow-up because it's good to finish up the old business before you set upon the new business. But this time it's kind of news, which is always a dangerous thing for a show that is as slow to come to market as ours is. But (laughs) I have something exciting and new in my hot little hands. Ooh, what is it? What is it? It's Foley. (laughs) It is a lovely little book called Mystery Science Theater 3000, A Cultural History, written by Matt Foy and Christopher J. Olson. Ooh, have you read it yet, or did you just get it? I got it recently, even though it's not going to be coming out until August 20th, which is probably a few days after this episode releases, Mm -hmm. but I did read it already, and in fact, uh, there's a little uh, blurb from me on the back of it. Oh, how clever of them to ask you. It was very nice of them to ask me, and I enjoyed the book, and I thought it was really neat. It is a cultural history of MST3K. It is coming from an academic perspective, but it's written for an audience of general readers, so if you're interested in that sort of thing, which if you listen to this podcast, you very well might be, Mm -hmm. uh, I totally recommend checking that out. It's got some neat stuff in it. It's a terrific resource for anyone who wants to think as well as laugh, along with MST3K, as Chris Pima, co-host of It's Just a Show, said. So, you know, and actually, if you go to the Amazon page for it. Mm-hmm. There's a little uh, infographic with Crow and Tom looking in amazement at my words. <gasps> really? That's so cool. <laughs> so this is a book that the general public can have access to, even though it is um, something that's more academically minded. Yeah, it's a hardcover. It's not. Uh, it's not academic price. It's on one hundred and fifty dollars or something. Oh, good lord! Yeah, and uh, it is in conversation with academic issues, and it brings up you know cultural theory and so forth. But it doesn't mm. do it in a way that I feel like you need to be you know knee deep in grad school to appreciate. I think it's very accessible, but you have to not be afraid of that sort of thing. Fair enough. So uh, I think you should go for it. Also, uh, it's part of a series that the publishers, Roman and Littlefield, put out called The Cultural History of Television. Oh. And it's got books out already on, like, The Simpsons and The Golden Girls and Star Trek and all your favorites. Have you looked at other books in this series or you just know it in the context of the series? I have not looked at other books in the series yet. There are some that I'm super interested in. They say that future volumes will include Sesame Street. <gasps> And the Mary Tyler Moore Show. Oh my gosh. And just for you, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Just for me. <laughs> Maybe they'll get you to blurb it. I, there might be one or two other people interested in such a thing. I don't know. It feels like all of the things that they've chosen have a broad audience of people who'd be interested in kind of hearing more about what it all means. Yeah, there's even one on fierce females on television. Oh. Which sounds intriguing as well. So I don't know, go check any of those out if you're interested. If they are as accessible as this one and as interesting as this one, then I don't think you'll be too disappointed. But I should say, uh, we're not making any money from this. I just think it's a neat book and I was excited to be asked to blurb it and it was fun to do. So there. So that's why I'm letting you all know about it. (laughs) Excellent. More reading about Mystery Science Theater 3000. Yes, but now... It's time for talking about Mystery Science of the Year 3000. This time we watched Season 4, Episode 5, Being from Another Planet. The movie opens on a pair of guys who, after a slight earthquake, discover a back room in King Tutankhamun's tomb? No way! There's almost no light, so it's hard to see that there's another sarcophagus in this back room. Looks cool, but it's surrounded by dead bodies. Now, this is a 3,000-year-old tomb, so that shouldn't be weird, but it freaks everyone out. It's fine, though. They get that thing out of the tomb and ship it back to some small university in the States. 
Next up, a professor, surrounded by all his favorite students, goes about slowly opening the sarcophagus and finding the mummy in there is covered in green stuff. You may think it's just spray paint, but you'd be wrong. It's an inactive spore of some kind. The x-ray technician comes in and douses the mummy and really everyone in the room with extra radiation. Turns out that x-ray shows some stones under the mummy's weird-shaped head, so the technician removes the crystal stones so he can sell them. The pawnbroker says they're worthless, but that's okay. He'll just sell them to some dumb frat boys to give to their girlfriends. While that's going on, the professor finds the mummy is missing from the sarcophagus. How could that have happened? The university folks think it's some frat prank, so they put out the word that they will take the mummy back, no questions asked. Very generous of them, considering a priceless artifact slash person's body is what they're searching for. But weird things start happening. The mold spores start growing on the sarcophagus, and everyone who touches it has, like, flesh-eating grossness happening. A few girls start dying all over campus with the same flesh-eating grossness, which, of course, prompts the fraternities to throw a party. Sure. With all this weird stuff happening, tensions between the faculty and university management are heightened. Management even thinks the professor has done this on purpose, stolen the mummy himself so he can do what he wants in his own time. Thankfully, we, the movie-watching audience, know something the authorities don't. The mummy is alive, not missing, and through its green-lensed world, we see it gathering up the crystals to add to a triangular transmitter thingaroo. One girl, she's even convinced that it didn't want to hurt her, it just wanted to get the crystal from her bracelet. And that's basically it. The mummy stalks around campus, gathering the crystals, killing people, maybe accidentally, spreading flesh-eating mold, all so it can complete a teleportation device to beam home. It's like E.T., collecting the parts to phone home. That's what the mummy-slash-alien does, collects the crystals, taps into the university power grid, phones home, and goes home. The end. Meanwhile, on the satellite of love, we begin with a game of 20 questions. But the questions are mostly based on movie taglines. Is it personal this time? Is it not only his nose that grows? Those are, those are based on taglines from Jaws the Revenge and from The Erotic Adventures of Pinocchio. Mm. Well, anyway, seems like a fun game. I'd play it. I don't know. But for the adventure exchange, the Mads present... Tragic Moments figurines. Ceramic bisque figurines that show children in great danger. Perfect for the sad grandma in your life. Joel and the bots have invented the Jack Palance impersonation kit. Or is it the Jack Palance impersonation kit? Either way, it's a gas mask that makes everything you say sound breathy and gravelly and interesting. The first part of the movie inspires Crow and Tom to make fun of the sad excuse of a mummy, which leads to them making fun of Billy Mummy from Lost in Space. But Joel corrects them. It's Bill Moomy. And Joel is a big fan. So they do a familiar faces segment about Bill Moomy, who wasn't even in this movie, including his work in the band Barnes and Barnes with their beloved hit, Fish Heads. Then the bots put Joel through one of those, you know, Halloween haunted house experiences, they, they put his hands into some bowls of chickpeas, jello, spaghetti, and a bowl with a head of cauliflower in it. But they tell him that it's eyeballs and guts and worms of hate and the brain of a ninth grader. And Joel plays along. And then he decides to eat the brain. They have fun. And then GPC congratulates the bots on what a good job they're doing in the theater. But Crow and Tom are feeling kind of blah. So Joel does his emergency rainy day fun sketch with wacky circus music, goofy costumes, and clowns in the Hexfield view screen. It's lots of fun, but after a little while, everyone feels empty. Because that's what happens when you have all your fun at once. 
Isn't that the truth? And over the closing credits, Tom insists that this is the worst film they've ever done, except maybe Castle of Fu Manchu, which he says is just as bad. And then Joel and the bots try to sell the weird alien device from the movie to TV's Frank on the TV's Frank shopping network. All he has to do is push the button to bring them back down, and it's all his. It almost works, too, until that mean Dr. Forrester stops them. Dang that man. What do you think, sirs? Chris, I love your Jack Palance impersonation. (laughs) I mean, I learned it from this episode of this show. I learned it by watching you, Joel. I learned it by watching you. Yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, What did you think about this episode, being from another planet? What did I think about this episode? I think it's all right. (laughs) It's okay. Like... The movie's not terrible. I'm I'm sure we'll get, like, mail about that because it's not a good movie. Let me just be clear. But, like, the movie has a plot, at least. And and there have been so many movies we've seen who have almost none of that. So, you know, it's in color, huh? And there's, like, glowing bits. We love glowing bits in the movie. And and they do a really good job of making fun of everything that's going on. There are some, um, some unfortunate riffs around the frat boys and the girlfriends but you know other than that whatever what you think so i agree this is a this is a fine episode it's all right uh, I, it's probably not the first one i would share to anybody i feel like this is an episode that i feel more warmly to than most people do because i don't think most people like this episode very much i would be very surprised if it was in anybody's top 10 let alone top 20 where did the um the ratings that everybody did of episodes where did it show up in there or did it it did not make it into the top 100 episodes when they did that when the netflix series was being kickstarted uh it didn't show up at all hmm. but i like it more than a lot of the episodes that did show up so what are you gonna do yeah, um, <laughs> there is that <laughs> i don't know i have a soft sweat for it maybe because it was just on a lot when i was a kid and uh watching the show and you know, it is a bit of a drab movie that doesn't have any big sparkle to it. It's not the most exciting thing. It's a very 80s movie. It is. But, you know, it's it's pretty solidly funny and the sketches are pretty good. And uh, it's fine. It's good. It's a work. It's a work a day episode <laughs> of a season four. It's it's pales in comparison with some of the material around it. But I, I still kind of like it. I think that that is a fair review. It pales in comparison to some of the other things this season, but we kind of like it. I mean, it's the episode immediately after Teenagers from Outer Space. Oh. So, like, you you can't compete with that one, I'm afraid. (laughs) No, you really can't. See, that's it's so hard when you have a really good episode. How do you follow it? Like, like what came after Manos, The Hands of Fate? Because I don't want to be that movie. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's just nothing you can do that can cap that kind of work. Well, Man of the Hands of Fate was the last episode of season four, and the first episode of season five was Warrior of the Lost World, which is pretty good and has Donald Pleasance in it, so... Okay, well, for this podcast, that makes it totally okay to follow such an act. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I will say that Tom is wrong. This is not at all the worst movie they've oh, done so far. Not Castle of Fumich, is so much worse than being from another planet. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean... It's okay for you to have a different opinion than Tom. I want to read for you uh, something from Paul Chaplin from the Amazing Colossal episode guide about this movie. Okay. People in this movie are almost kind of attractive, (laughs) but then not at all. Oh. They're more repulsive the longer you watch. Susie, Doug's TA, and more, should be pretty, but her expression never changes. Her face, her clothes, her body, everything just kind of hangs there. The wardrobe department was good at making breasts seem really unappealing. (laughs) Wow. Oh my gosh. And for a movie in the 80s, that's amazing. (laughs) Do you agree with Paul's assessment there? I admit I wasn't particularly paying attention to the breasts while I was watching. Yeah, that doesn't seem to be your bag. I I no, the boobs seemed fine to me. Yeah, they seemed functional. I don't sure, know. I, I, I mean... wasn't thinking about them until I read this. And then I didn't go back and rewatch the episode just to watch the breasts. I, that seems like you're not really doing your full research here, Chris. I mean, <sighs> yeah. 
Yeah, no, it was, it, I mean, you know, the boobs were fine. There were plenty of tank tops and nice low cut things going on. There was the college students getting ready for the frat party that was a dress up party. And one of the girls was dressed as Cleopatra and she had something on that was very low cut. And, um, you know, she made some comment about what Cleopatra would say. And Tom's response was, I think Cleopatra would say to cover those things up. And, you know, perhaps they were reacting to the boob thing in real time while watching it. But yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't think it was all that bad. I, I should also say that, of course, this is one of those uh, college movies where all the college kids are seem to be played by people who are around 30 years old. Sure, but you say that as if that isn't true for every movie about college kids. Well, I know. I'm just saying. I'm just yeah. saying this one as well. These, I, I, I found most of the students both sort of indistinguishable from one another and also hard to tell if they were actually students or just yep. had yep. smaller roles on the faculty. Like yeah. the, the x-ray technician, was he a student? I guess he was, because I think he shows up at the frat party, and that seems like a student thing to do. Sure, but in the 80s, that would have happened. Teachers would have gone to parties. I think if Animal House has taught us anything, teachers go to frat parties. So, Or people who work on campus, not necessarily professors. There you go. It also didn't seem weird to me that there was, like, weird dating vibes going on between the blonde who turns out to be a TA and the professor, because it just seemed like, you know, they were the same age or similar. Well, they weren't. They, there was a, there was a, about a 13-year age gap between the actors, but the TA was nearly 30 when the movie was filmed, and so that's fine. Sure. But also, yes, that sort of... Uh, power dynamic thing of the professor and the TA hooking up was more common back then, even if maybe not to be celebrated. But Sure. I mean, Dante's already put them in what, like the seventh, eighth circle? Like it's, it's not a good look. You know, Dante's review of this movie was really savage. Seriously, that man goes for the jugular every time. So unless I'm forgetting something or my Googling didn't work, this is the only MST3K episode that deals with ancient Egypt stuff. Oh, that seems really surprising to me. There's so many B-movies out there that are about mummies and mummy curses and things like that. How is it possible that this is the only one that they picked up? Well, because the mummy movie that they did was the robot versus the Aztec mummy. Uh Oh, that's right. As famously seen in the third movie in the Mummy installment, there are mummies in other places than Egypt. Anyway, seriously, no other movies with ancient Egypt? Yeah, as far as I can tell, no. I'm sure I'm forgetting something. I don't know. R listeners, write in if I am. But Totally, like... because there seems to be like secret ancient Egypt in a lot of places. Like, you and I had this conversation off mic, but Crow references this being just like the opening of his favorite movie, Mannequin. And I'm like, there's no ancient Egypt in Mannequin. So, of course, I had to look it up. And yeah, the Mannequin is the reincarnated, I guess, or time-traveling soul of Kim Cattrall from ancient Egypt trying to find the time where she fits in. And there's like a whole thing, a whole thing about her being from ancient Egypt. And I had no idea. I didn't remember that about the movie. I just remember that like Andrew McCarthy has the hots for a mannequin. Like, why would I remember there's ancient Egypt in that? That is a little bit surprising that that movie goes there. It's true. Huh. Now, is she an alien, though? Okay, so I'm going to go with probably not, but I don't know how she came to be before the movie started. They don't actually address that. But she's a woman who's turned down many suitors so that now only the dung dealer will marry her. And she's like, yes, I'm going to pray to the gods to perhaps get out of this whole arranged marriage business. Wow. And of course, they completely ignore the flooding Nile and the needs of the people. They instead allow Kim Cattrall to uh, time travel. Her name's Emmy in the movie, by the way. They allow Emmy to time travel through many different times. Apparently she meets Christopher Columbus. It's a big thing. Okay, that happens off scene. And then, you know, she meets Andrew McCarthy and decides to get married. 
because that's what we do. You know, I should say, because uh, this is something that we've talked about on this show before, but I, I finally did do it. I finally watched Bill and Ted. Oh, oh, I love Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Wait, which Bill and Ted? Did you just watch the Excellent Adventure or did you also watch the uh, Bogus Journey? I just watched the first movie. Nice. It it was fine. <gasps> you stop. You don't have the kind of enthusiasm that that movie really requires. It did not make me feel enthusiastic. It wasn't bad or anything. I, it was exactly what I thought it was going to be like oh. in many ways. Uh, it, it was perfectly fine. It was tight. Uh, it, it was more than painless to watch. But I did not immediately turn on the second movie, even though I had it all queued up. Even though you knew that that's where he has the chess game with death? I, you know, I still might watch it. Who knows? I've got all three of them ready to go. Just That's so good. I haven't seen the third one yet. But you bring this up because there's ancient Egypt in the first one. I don't remember ancient Egypt in the first no, one. No, no, because time traveling. And also, <gasps> oh, this movie yes. is originally called Time Walker. But it's one of those movies that they did on MSC3K because Film Ventures International bought the movie, repackaged it, but they had to change the title and the opening credit sequence, which is why the opening credit sequence makes no sense. They're opening the tomb, but you don't get to see any of the visuals because the original opening credits are playing and they can't show those. So they had to hide all of that. Okay, well, I'm just going to say, I saw the first 20 minutes of Time Walker. They didn't miss much. It's all black in any way. Like it's, It is like a big cave with a swinging naked light bulb it's this is not very well lit you're not gonna see very much anyway no the movie is not at any point a cinematographic masterpiece so you're not really missing too much and that's why the boobs don't work exactly but anyways the original film was called time walker because it was all about the time travel thing which is nice because it what i was surprised that this movie didn't lean into was the whole ancient aliens nonsense yeah yeah you did have to get that inside of the riffs did ancient aliens bring us Lee press on nails? Yeah. And, and, you know, making fun of the Time Life Mysteries of the Unknown book series and the <laughs> yes. TV ads for them, which were amazing. They were. I think we've talked about that before somehow in one of our Atlantis episodes, I guess. But being from another planet itself doesn't make any big claims about how aliens visited Egypt and therefore they were able to make the pyramids or and actually ancient Egyptians are descendants of aliens or you know, panspermia or whatever. No, it's just an alien visited. You couldn't touch him. He caused a sickness. They figured out how to trap him for a few thousand years. And now we've woken him up again with our modern technology. Because we're so dumb sometimes. <laughs> I mean, we totally are. Isn't that the promise of most mummy movies? The like, we disturbed the crypt and now we're cursed and there's a plague on humanity. We disturb the crypt, and there's an alien walking among us, killing us all, and his extraterrestrial mold is killing us and eating our flesh. Like, it's our fault. And now we've got to call El Santo to clean it all up. Exactly, because that man knows how to deal with a mummy. So it seems like you've watched a thousand more mummy movies than I have. <laughs> I love the mummy Specifically, the 1999 Mummy movie with Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weisz, because that movie does everything that I want a Mummy movie to do. Which is? Which is, it has an ancient curse. You get to see the full backstory with like some elaborate CGI vision of what ancient Egypt used to be, right? And then you get the 1930s when desecrating tombs and stealing things from indigenous cultures was still totally fine for some reason. And they like inadvertently awaken a curse by doing something that should have been totally innocuous, but surprise, wasn't. And then, you know, they, they, they get their whole... um you know, fluid sucked out of their bodies and a uh, plague comes on Egypt and I get lots of really good effects like the hail falling from the sky and turning to fire on the ground. I love that one. Love it. I mean, it sounds like stuff happens in that movie, which is a little more than I can say for being from another planet. Yeah, I mean, but you still have that same idea, right? You have a mummy and he's trying to collect a bunch of things. Right. And then once he collects the things... Uh-huh. This mummy's going to do a totally different thing because it turns out, not a mummy. He's, He's an, an alien. alien. He's E.T. Yeah. E. 
not Imhotep. So here's the thing. E.T. came out the same year this movie did. No, it didn't. Yeah, it did. Really? Yeah, they're both from 82. Wow, but E.T. looks so good. Well, that's because it had a budget and Steven Spielberg and his cinematographers. Sure. And, and this is the only film that Tom Kennedy ever directed. I'm shocked, of course. Shocked. But uh, my point is that uh, E.T. was released in theaters in May and Time Walker came out in November. You keep saying it's, it's like E.T. Are they stealing that from E.T.? I mean... You know, probably. But it's not like it's not like there aren't other alien movies out there where the alien comes down to Earth and then has to do a thing to be able to leave. Sure. Right? Like, E.T.'s not the only movie that put that storyline on the map. I mean, pretty much most of the time there's a horror movie. There's either a person collecting something in order and they have to kill people along the way or, you know, they're actually just a curse and a plague on humanity which is totally different right it just changes their motivation i feel like the mummy the alien's motivation is i want to get the heck out of here i don't want to be on earth like this poor alien gets stuck on the planet starts killing a bunch of egyptians he wants to like power up his phone thing but he's in ancient egypt there's no power supply he's gotta wait he's gotta wait until he can tap into a power grid like there's one at the university. So, you know, it seems to me like the ancient Egyptians, they did him a favor. Yeah, exactly. What's he complaining about? He's not complaining. He's very silent. Maybe. He's breathing pretty heavy as he's walking around. <laughs> it's true. Oh, thank goodness for the bots freaking out during all of the green screen stuff, because otherwise that whole part of the movie is way too long and way too boring. I agree. Actually, that was one of the most interesting things about it, watching it this time, was thinking, wow, the bots doing the joke of acting like this is scary makes this more compelling. Yep. Like, it's a better film because they're doing that, which is wild. But that's also, like, the idea of having somebody at a comedy show who's, like, a seed who will laugh. <laughs> and that will encourage everybody else to laugh. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, 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 it's totally an effective theater trick. Yeah. Pro tip from Chris. Seed your audience. Well, it's time, once again, to do another round of Familiar Faces. <gasps> and now there's a jingle. Familiar faces, familiar faces, familiar faces, familiar faces, familiar faces. It's going to be a slightly shorter Familiar Faces, I guess, because most of the faces are not that familiar. But the first one we're going to talk about is Ben Murphy, who plays Professor McCadden, our main dude. And he's the one who they talked about doing lots of famous things, right? Well, lots of famous things seems like a stretch, but he was in a show that they mentioned several times called Alias Smith and Jones. Mm, I've never watched that. What's the what's the storyline for that? Uh, it's a Western. It lasted for about three seasons in the early 70s, and it's about two guys who are outlaws, and they're offered clemency if they remain fugitives until it's politically expedient or something like that. I don't know. Are they like the A-team? Do they go around helping people and then they're being chased by the law? Let's say sure. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> I, am, I, I don't want to watch this TV show. Nothing about it looks appealing. And Ben Murphy did not inspire me in being from another planet. And he also didn't inspire me when he was in Riding with Death from the KTMA era, which was uh, based on a TV show that he started in called Gemini Man for one season after his Elliot Smith and Jones business. He's just not a compelling person. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. He did manage to be on an episode of Murder, She Wrote. Oh, well, good for him. But he was on The Virginian, not Bonanza. Blasphemy. Exactly. I mean, he had to make his own Western to try and make up for the fact that he was not on Bonanza. Like, that just speaks volumes. Maybe that's what it was. Uh, next, we're going to look at Robert Random, who plays Jack Parker. He's one of these students slash faculty. I don't know. But he's the guy who recognizes that the alien drawing is a schematic. Oh, he's the one who has the computer that keeps beeping, telling them that the reactor's going to blow. 
Only it never does. It just kind of everybody's like, hey, there's like a nuclear reactor on campus and it's going to blow at any time. But nobody seems bothered by this. <laughs> weird. Very weird. Uh, he also made an appearance in season six episode Village of the Giants as one of the kids who gets bigged. Ooh. So if you want to see his nipples, there's where you can look. Oh, I mean, maybe the boobs are better there. I am legally obliged to point out that he is Canadian. Oh, good work. CanCon. Yep. This is now CanCon. And uh, he unfortunately was in Gunsmoke, not Bonanza. But he's Canadian, so we'll forgive him. And he's in Village of the Giants, which is a great episode. So. Yes, that is true. Okay, then we're going to talk about James Karen, who plays Dr. Rossmore, the university president. The one who wants to, you know, cover all this up and not get it in the news and all that. Nice. All right. He was in a ton of stuff that you might recognize him as being a that guy kind of thing. Bonanza? Well, he was in Bonanza (gasps) under attack. Uh, What? Bonanza colon under attack. This is the 1995 TV movie picturing a new generation of the Cartwright kids. You, You haven't seen this one? You know... There are just some things that I just can't do, and desecrate my memories of Bonanza is one of them. Okay, but what if I told you this made-for-TV movie had Michael Landon Jr. in it? I mean, presumably it had Michael Landon in it, too, so that he could get his son a job. I'm sorry, that was really mean. I don't mean to suggest such a thing. I'm sure Michael Landon Jr. is very talented on his own. And he probably looked a lot like his dad and thus looked like a kid of Little Joe, which was probably what they were going for. Yes, none of the original actors are in it, but uh, it's about the kids, right? So, yes, he, he plays a younger Cartwright. Yeah, that makes sense. In addition to Michael Landon Jr., it's got Richard Roundtree, which is wild. But not wild enough. It's got everybody's favorite, Jack Elam. Nice. And also in that movie, Leonard Nimoy. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. Huh. Leonard Nimoy had a really weird time in the 80s, didn't he? Uh, Yeah, and his 80s continued into the 90s when this movie came from. (laughs) And next, we're going to talk about one of the actors in this film who's probably not as famous as her musician father was. I am, of course, talking about Melissa Prophet. Yes, of course. Who plays Jenny, the one who's in the shower when the mummy comes by, but doesn't kill her. Because it's... It's really important in an 80s movie with fraternities that there's somebody in the shower. I mean, we just, we need to be reminded of Porky's. Porky's came out the year before. So yeah, I guess we did need to be reminded of Porky's. No, I mean, we didn't, but we did. Uh, She does show up in a few films, Goodfellas, Casino, things like that. Uh, And I think she did a lot of work behind the camera. She is the daughter of a guy named Johnny Prophet, who was noticed by Frank Sinatra put out a few albums, and then kind of drifted into obscurity where I uh, I was trying to find out more about him. And I found a blog post of somebody who's like, no one knows who this person is, despite the fact that he put out six albums. What's going on? But I don't know. That sounds interesting. And I guess the fact that he's got a daughter who is working in the business that we call show wasn't (laughs) something that pinged on his radar in his research. Fair enough. It's she's not exactly famous either. But uh, I don't know. I'm kind of curious. I only just found out about this, so I haven't had a chance to listen to any of his music, but it it looks kind of intriguing. I want to know more. He worked with the whole Rat Pack. He he was in the circuit in, in, you know, Vegas and Reno, it seems. And he had a fun time with it, but uh, didn't leave a, much of a mark. Uh, that doesn't mean he didn't have a good time or a good career of it. Just means he's not famous. Not, he must have had a decent career if he had six albums. Yeah. Uh, the other person in this movie who fits that description is Sherry Belafonte, who is then married and going by Sherry Belafonte Harper, but they have since divorced and she doesn't use it anymore. So there you go. There you go. She's got, you know, a career of her own. She was in a 80s TV show called Hotel and a 90s Canadian show called Beyond Reality for a while. She uh, would eventually pose nude for Playboy in 2000. All right. So I guess you can see her nipples too. I don't know. I I don't have a lot to say about (laughs) Sherry Belafonte. She seems like she's fine and she's had a perfectly nice acting career. And I don't want to talk about Sherry Belafonte specifically to talk about her father, but 
dang, her father's pretty great. So It's true. It's true. Singer, civil rights activist, and all around pretty awesome fellow. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but if you don't know much about Harry Belafonte, he's worth reading up on a little bit. And of course, like Sherry Belafonte is there as the college radio DJ inside of our movie. And I got a soft spot in my heart for uh, university radio DJs. So, you know, like what a great role. I'm so glad she landed it. So you're saying that because you also had a bit of a stint as a college radio DJ that uh, you saw yourself in Sherry Belafonte? I mean, if I was going to see myself in any character inside of this movie as they are all a wasteland, yes. She by far has the most interesting job inside of the... I mean, she's the photographer. She's the radio DJ. She does not indulge in going to some dumbass frat parties. So, like... She's absolutely going to be the one that is the most interesting to me. Yeah. See, if I had to uh, tag myself in one of the characters, I am definitely Ankh von Harris, the mummy, uh, yes. lumbering mm -hmm. around, desperate to get off of this planet. Noble traveler, I believe we'd call you. Bonking into the walls, chasing after lost doodads. Totally. Where did I put that? Uh... Why can't I find it? <laughs> There's one last person I want to shout out from this film, although certainly not a familiar face for most people. One of the writers of the film uh, is named James Williams. He also plays Jeff, who's one of the students. Oh. I don't know. He's he's in there. It doesn't matter. The only thing that's important is that he once played Flesh Gordon. Flesh with an E? Yeah, in 1974's film flesh gordon without the rocking soundtrack i can't sing it if it's flesh i mean you know i i haven't watched the movie so maybe it also has a rocking soundtrack just uh, a different one you're right you're right i am being so close-minded <laughs> it's just that the soundtrack to flash gordon is so good oh i just can't imagine flesh gordon competing it's true also flesh gordon came out in 1974 which is well before the 1980 Flash Gordon that you're thinking of came oh, out. Oh, well, I mean, still, that poor guy, that poor guy, he's in Flash Gordon and being from another planet slash Time Walker. Yeah, which he helped write. I mean... F Flash Gordon also has Craig T. Nelson doing the voice of the great god Porno and a character named Dr. Flexi Jerkoff. Craig T. Nelson, isn't he the guy who went on to become the voice of of Mr. Incredible in The Incredibles? Yeah, yeah. A in addition to being, you know, coach and a bunch of other stuff. Sure, sure, sure. That blah, 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 blah. He's Mr. Incredible. <laughs> hey, everybody, it's time for The Shallow Thirteen. It's time for The Shallow Thirteen. Thirteen ancient spores sure to infect you with fun facts about today's episode, Being From Another Planet. Go, Chris, go. So, yeah, this is the episode where Joel's invention is the Jack Palance impersonator kit. Or maybe the Jack Palance impersonator kit. Either way, it's a shame they didn't hold off on this idea, since they would eventually do a few movies starring Jack, like Outlaw in Season 5, or Angel's Revenge in Season 6. Or The Shape of Things to Come in Season 13. But it would have been a little weird to wait that long. But this episode came out only a few months after Jack would win an Academy Award for playing Curly in City Slickers. And he decided to show off how fit he was at age 73 by doing a bunch of one-armed push-ups right there on the main stage during his acceptance speech. After opening the sarcophagus, Joel has the professor telling his student slash TA slash girlfriend... All right, now mix me up a picture of Jim Gibson's. Ooh, don't forget the onion. A Gibson is typically made with gin, but, you know, I guess somebody might try to make it with vodka. Anyway, basically, a Gibson is a martini, but as Tom notes, with a pickled onion instead of an olive. Yep, that's all it takes to call something a new cocktail. Some assistants roll in an x-ray machine to scan the mummy, and Joel says... Why the Shelly Long and Henry Winkler and Cam Goofy coming this summer? 
Sadly, Camp Goofy doesn't exist because I would totally watch it, but I could watch Shelley Long and Henry Winkler star in the 1982 film Night Shift. It's directed by Ron Howard and has the first leading role for Michael Keaton, and it's a comedy set in a morgue. Sign me up! When the technician sees the jewels on the x-ray, once again the quip goes to Joel. Well, look at this. Steelies and Aggies. Hmm? Steelies and Aggies are kinds of marbles, and they get their adorable nicknames because of what they're made from. Steel or agate. Other marble types include alleys, which are made of alabaster, glassies, made of glass, and commies, made of clay, which at one point was very common. That's right. We used to encourage kids to play with commies. And while the technician tries to steal those jewels, we cut to a statue. And Tom says, Victor Bono. Victor Bono was the guy who played King Tut on the 1960s Batman TV show. See, because the sarcophagus was found in King Tut's tomb. Oh, and he also plays High Priest Sorak in The Greatest Story Ever Told with, you guessed it, Donald Pleasance. The technician reaches into his lab coat, and we get these riffs. Mm, what does it got in its pockets, galum, galum? Hmm, time for a razzle. Candy or gum? Razzles date back to 1966, and the gimmick is that they start out as candy, but once you chew them, they become chewing gum. Now this sounds awful to me, but I guess Charlotte and I will have to try them out on one of these episodes. Also, Crow is obviously doing Gollum's voice there, my precious. And it's interesting to hear an impression that predates Andy Serkis's interpretation of Gollum's voice. Perhaps Trace is drawing inspiration from Brother Theodore's performance in the Rankin-Bass Hobbit movie? Anyway, I, I guess we're doing a play-by-play -play of this part of the episode. Um, the technician hides the x-rays, and we get this from Crow. Lou Diamond Phillips in The Fifth Power. Jimmy Smith. The Fifth Power is a 1962 Brazilian sci-fi film about a plot to use subliminal messages to overthrow the government. Wait, what does this have to do with anything? Ah, The First Power is a 1990 film starring Lou Diamond Phillips as a detective trying to stop a serial killer. Only problem is the serial killer is a Satan worshiper and Satan has rewarded him with all sorts of supernatural powers. And of course, the Jimmy Smith's thing is a reference to the 1991 Blake Edwards film Switch. Ellen Barkin was the star of the movie, so her name was contractually supposed to come before the name of the film and Jimmy Smith's name would come after. But in the TV ads, the announcer just says the film's name and then Jimmy Smith's. Switch. Jimmy Smith's. Without any context. Link in the show notes if you've never watched this weird moment in movie advertising. Later in the movie, a cop pokes his head into the lab and we get this. Hey, it's Murray the Cop. Which one, Herb Edelman or Al Molinaro? Murray the Cop is from The Odd Couple, and he was played by Herb Edelman in the movie and Al Molinaro in the TV show. You might remember Al Molinaro as Al Del Vecchio, the guy who owned the diner on Happy Days after Pat Morita left the show. Herb Edelman, meanwhile, you might also recognize as Stanley, the ex-husband of Dorothy from The Golden Girls. He also appeared in ten episodes of Murder, She Wrote. Ten! Well, I mean, what, are you not going to cast Stanley Zbornak in an episode of Murder, She Wrote? Don't be ridiculous. And that's time! Well, uh, we had a bit of stuff to talk about with Egypt and mummy movies there, and some familiar faces, and I feel like we have time for one last final factoid. Ooh. And I wanted to bring something up. Oh, okay. What would you like to bring to us as a final factoid, Chris? I want to talk a bit about the Invention Exchange, and specifically about the Tragic Moments figurines. Oh, okay. These were a lot. <laughs> <laughs> were they more or less upsetting to you than the Precious Moments figurines that they're making fun of are? I couldn't really say. They're both pretty bad. Uh, oh, 
Yeah, the Precious Moments figurines, for anybody who hasn't seen them, are just, they're really kind of washed out. There's no colors to them whatsoever. They're very bland looking, and they have very angelic faces, very white angelic faces, and they're just, they're very sappy. They're very sappy. And by sappy, we mean worth lots of money. Oh, is that what sappy means these days? Great. <laughs> well, there was a huge fad for Precious Moments figurines, and so somebody has referred to them as the Christian Beanie Babies of the collectibles economy. Oh my gosh, that is the perfect description. Whoa! Because <laughs> there's totally one with the kid praying on their knees, right? And it's like the Calvin sticker that everybody has on the back of their car, only it's an angelic little praying kid and not like the naughty kid who's learned to pray, which is a totally different vibe. Right. But also, like, they were some of them limited edition things, and they went up in value, and it, it's wild. Did you grow up with any of these figurines around the house or, like, at Grandma's house or anything like that? So I totally know what they are. So somebody in my family circle must have had them, but not my mother. My mother's not a tchotchke kind of person. Like, she doesn't collect things, you know what I mean? And have them, because this is the kind of thing that people would collect a whole bunch of them and have them in a cabinet or on their mantle or displayed somewhere so that you could see how many precious moments they've collected over time. Um, so somebody I know must have done it, but I can't think of who it would have been i don't know I do, who in your life was a precious moments type i didn't have any precious moments type people around that my stepmother had a few things that were like a few steps removed from precious moments she had a few like little figurines of frogs lazing about yep you know things like that but uh, they weren't as explicitly christian as a lot of the precious moments things were and and these definitely were not up to that caliber, let's say. Uh, they, they were definitely knockoffs. I actually have somewhere, it's in deep storage now, but I somewhere have <laughs> a Precious Moments knockoff figurine, uh, which someone got for me because uh, I guess I made a joke about it and then they found it for sale and they bought it for me. Uh, so the figurine says underneath it on a little you know, plaque, Jesus is my coach. <gasps> Oh my gosh, I know this one. Yeah, well, I had it, and we lived together, so you might yes. have been in the same house with it. I was trying to think, what could you have had that would be like a precious moment? And wow, that just hit me. You got to let our <laughs> listeners in on this. So uh, it's got Jesus uh, passing the ball, I guess. He's passing something. I don't know whether he's supposed to be passing or receiving the ball, because, uh, you know, passing makes more sense, theologically speaking, from a Christian doctrinal point of view. Sure. He should be passing. Passing the ball, I think. But either way, uh, he's passing the ball to a kid who's, you know, in a football outfit. He's, of course, in the traditional robes uh, of a Jesus figurine. He's playing football in sandals. It's weird. That is true. That is true. Uh, but there's a second kid uh, who's sort of, I guess, going in for a tackle. Sure, Jesus. tackle Jesus. That seems like a great idea. He's got his arm around Jesus. And if you turn the figurine around, uh, you, you'll find that his hand is resting gently on Jesus's butt. <laughs> which is the most delightful part of this figurine. I don't know. It's very silly. It's very funny. It's clearly meant to be quite sincere, but it just comes off as weird, which so many of these things do. No, Yeah. Anyway, I wanted to talk about this in particular, both because it's on the episode, but also because Sam Butcher, the guy who invented and made the Precious Moments figurines, mm -hmm. passed away in June Oh, at the age of 85. It's a nice long life. Yeah. How many of the Precious Moments figurines did he have in his home upon his passing? I, he made a cathedral of them, or the company did anyways. I I, I don't know exactly who's in charge of what, because was, he was with a partner who I guess was the business side of things. Okay. But yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole chapel, the Precious Moments Chapel in Carthage, Missouri. Wow. Which has paintings of him, and I believe they have some of the figurines as well. I think they also used to get them in a like a bus and tour around. Like you could go to the Precious Moments collection tour Touring bus. Touring collection? Oh. Something like that, yeah. I can't even. Yep. 
I mean, not that I want to have some of the tragic moments that they've come up with, um, but the tragic moments, every time they named one, had a real emotional gut punch. Uh-huh. And I think the precious moments are going for that same thing, but because they're so sappy, um, they feel... They fail to meet that mark for me. I'm sure for other people who actually decide that they want to own them, they they have that kind of emotional connection. But, uh, whoa, nothing will have the emotional connection of Sparky's last romp. (laughs) I mean, I'm on the website now, and I went over to the uh, figurines and the inspirational figurines in particular. And there is the first one on this list is a little girl coated angel with butterfly wings that are sort of washed out blue and uh she's it comes in two versions but the first one is the one with blonde hair and the name of the figurine is you were born to fly blonde figurine now i know that there's also you were born to fly (laughs) brunette figurine and it's not it's not meant to be like you were born to fly blonde (laughs) but i'd like to read it that way I do too. That sounds lovely. That's what I would love for somebody to have said to me at some point in time, like coming into my own, you were born to fly blonde. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, wait, there's also kick like a girl blonde. (laughs) Yeah. Kick like a girl blonde. (laughs) I apologize. If you're redheaded, there's nothing for you. (laughs) They don't think you exist. If you've been affected by the issues on this show, if you'd like to share a precious moment of your own, or if you'd like to ask us anything, get in touch with us. Our email is info at itsjustashow.com, and we would love to hear from you. This show is made possible by listeners like you, and like our randomly selected supporter, Sean. Thank you, Sean. For as little as $1 an episode, you too can be like Sean and help us research and record this show. You can join us in a friendly Discord, and you can hear all our super fan bonus bits. Find out more at itsjustashow.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash itsjustashow. And if you want to follow up on anything that was mentioned today, you'll find links in our show notes at itsjustashow.com slash episode slash 158. Chris, I feel like we have just slummed it through one of the least punchy episodes of season four. Um, I'm looking for something maybe a little uplifting to be our our next episode, something that really brings us back to the best of what MST3K has to offer. What are we watching next? We are watching season nine, episode two, The Phantom Planet. Ooh season nine that's a sci-fi era that means it could go either way for us right yep so we will at least get to go out into space and we'll get to encounter the phantom planet next time but until then bad movie you're soaking in it we now leave medical center to join trapper john already in progress take it away theme squad
仲好啲，仲好啲，仲好啲。